I took a break You're making a huge mistake Thinking you can take the throne Look at you trembling Step into the lion's den Bet you wish you stayed at home Begging for mercy underneath your breath When I ain't even sweating Yet my land is written in the stone yeah. You're crying danger in defeat Is now your only friend Even your mama's gotta know Hello, hello, and welcome everyone once again to In Time. My name is Nicholas Lamar Souter. Uh, as you know, if you're a, a fan of the show, we cover all sorts of topics, but we have kind of an affinity for uh, religious topics, philosophy, religion, uh, formal logic, things like this. And so we have, uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have Floyd F.P. on uh, a couple months ago to uh, discuss the book of Daniel, which is a very controversial book in the Old Testament, and uh, I think uh, quite conclusively uh, was a, a was fraud, it was not um, uh, written by uh, this, this prophet Daniel. And so uh, uh, Floyd was uh, very good in giving us a, a very detailed analysis of uh, what uh, why people believe that the book isn't real and, and, and what's contained therein, and, and uh, so uh, we, we will be linking to that at the, at the in the description below. But tonight we have him back to continue discussing the book of Daniel, and tonight he's going to be talking about the prophecy in Daniel, the prophecy of the seven uh, seventy weeks, and so uh, looking forward to that. We'll bring him out in just a minute. On a week from Thursday, Dr. Josh will be here to discuss the uh, Old Testament apologetics uh, by Christians. Christianity, of course, needing uh, certain elements of the Old Testament in order to uh, justify Christianity itself. But the God of the Old Testament is somewhat different than Jesus. Uh, how do you reconcile the two? How do you reconcile 
uh, some of the, uh, the the terrible things of the Old Testament, uh, from slavery to genocide. So we'll, Dr. Josh will be on to discuss that. On Friday, we will have another overtime with Xandering and myself, the little 15-minute uh, shorts, and as we continue to discuss the role of government and the conservative versus liberal interpretations of what the solutions are to common problems. We're also going to be doing an after show, uh, just a, a, a call-in hang. You guys can call in and we'll chat. Have a good time. I've, I've really been enjoying those. I hope you have too. And then on Monday, we're going to be doing the Patreon Hangout. If you want to know more about that, you can either contact me. You can just become a patron. The link is down in the bottom. Otherwise, if uh, you, you're here now, I hope you will like and subscribe. It's the best way to help the show and genuinely helps us out in the analytics. So thank you very much for that. And uh, without any further ado, let's bring out Dr. Josh. Uh, Dr. Josh, I apologize. Dr. Josh, is there. let's bring out uh, Floyd. Uh, Floyd Epi. Floyd, how are you? Okay, thanks for having me back on. My yeah, pleasure. I, I don't have uh, the credentials of, of Dr. Josh, but I'll take that as a compliment. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Oh, well, it's it, it's been a uh, it's been a, a long uh, couple of days, so we've been pretty busy over here. So um, when you last came on, we talked about uh, Daniel in general and talked a lot about uh, reasons why people thought that perhaps Daniel uh, was not an actual person and that the, the book had probably many authors. Uh, we ended up, uh, we, we sped through sort of the last bit, so I was wondering if maybe you could sort of uh, conclude us with the end of that, and we can go on to uh, the prophecy of 70 weeks. Sure, sure. Because um, a lot of conservative Christians and evangelicals love the book of Daniel because they think it contains, you know, real prophecy, and also um, uh, prophecy directly about about Jesus, and we're going to get into this, the 70 weeks prophecy found in uh, Daniel 9. So Daniel 9 is one of the go-to uh, prophecies that uh, some evangelicals um, uh, like uh, in uh, declaring that Jesus fulfilled uh, messianic prophecy. I'd say that that's kind of like one of the top three. I would say the other two would be Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Um, as kind of like the top prophecies I like to go to, to, to claim that Jesus fulfilled prophecy. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of back up a little where I left off uh, last time about uh, Daniel uh, interpreting the, the four kingdoms uh, that, that are described and, um, and, and how that ties into the new Testament and, and the claims about Jesus uh, during uh, right before the, um, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 CE, um, a lot of Jewish uh, communities were turning to books like uh, Daniel to, to help uh, understand the times they're going through. It was, it was a difficult time. The, the uh, Roman government was ruling over them. Uh, they were fairly persecuted. And uh, you know, eventually that led, to, led up to uh, the uh, Roman Jewish war. Um, that uh, ended w with the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 70 CE. Um, so when they read apocalyptic books like Daniel, um, it, it gave them uh, it gave them a lot of meaning, and they, and they would take it and apply it to their times. And, and that was very common, not only among the Christians, but also Jewish groups as, as well. And you see that in the Quran community that brought us the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so, uh, so just to leave off, uh, just to leave off where I, I wanted to start off where I left off last time, uh, I talked about the four kingdoms and the, the secular, critical, and liberal scholar view is the four kingdoms was Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. And in fact, um, the book of Daniel talks about Greece specifically. Um, yet, sort of Christians and early traditional views they, they interpret as Babylonian, Medo-Persian, uh, Greek, and then the Roman empires. And we, we've seen that not only with uh, Christians, but also uh, Jewish writers such as Josephus. And um, what they're basically doing is just applying the book Daniel to their time. Uh, so, you know, they, they, uh, they, they viewed it as apocalyptic uh, literature that uh, a great evil 
was uh, ruling over them. So they were, you know, and, and who was that at the time? Well, it was Rome. So they had to apply it to Rome. So with that in mind, we're going to see how that view carries on and gets applied to Jesus with the, with the 70 weeks prophecy. So, and just to say, you know, um, there's also future interpretations as well, because basically the, the resurrection of the dead didn't happen. So the, they look to the, to the, the last week of the 70 weeks as sometime in the future. And we see that reflected in Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, where he states that the 10 horns of Daniel 724 represents the 10 nation, uh, the 10 nation Euro uh, European uh, economic community. That's what uh, Norman uh, Proteus uh, book, Daniel Commentary, calls these interpretations the deplorable history of the interpretation of this book. And we've, we've seen it interpreted, you know, throughout history to mean something to uh, the reader rather than, um, you know, rather than trying to understand what, what the authors of Daniel were actually really trying to uh, convey. Um, so, um, again, we see that with Josephus. Um, uh, Josephus writes in his Antiquities that our nation suffered uh, these things under Antiochus Epiphanes, according to Daniel's vision, and he wrote many years before they came true. In the same way, Daniel also wrote about the Roman Empire and that they would capture Jerusalem and destroy the temple. Too bad Josephus didn't really support that view, though. And, and again, uh, in the book of Daniel, Rome is not mentioned at all, where, where Greece is uh, directly mentioned. Um, and again, in early uh, Christian commentators, uh, we see them uh, reversing Rome as well. For example, in, in Jerome's commentary on Daniel, he says, now the fourth kingdom, which clearly refers to, Rome, uh, to the Romans, is the iron empire that breaks into pieces and overcomes all others. We should therefore concur that uh, with the traditional interpretation of all the, comment, uh, all the commentators of the Christian church, that at the end of the world, when the Roman empire is to be destroyed, there shall be 10 kings who will partition the Roman world amongst themselves. So again, we have these early commentators, you know, declaring it was, uh, you know, the Roman empire that, that uh, Daniel talked about. So from that, uh, I'm going to get uh, more into the 70 weeks now. So, so, and what this is all about is interpret the book, right? So um, um, there's different ways to interpret the Bible. So we're going we're to look at that. Uh, uh, there's a term called exegesis. And what that simply means is it's the critical interpretation of the Bible. And that's opposed to eisegesis, which is the interpretation of the text by reading into it one's own ideas. And that's what I'm going to be pointing out uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bit uh, through my presentation. People like Josephus, Jerome, uh, the evangelical of today, they're reading into their own interpretation of what they want it to mean rather than just trying to actually objectively understand what the authors, you know, were trying to say. So there's, there's different approaches in interpreting the Bible. The one I follow is called the historical critical method or the higher criticism. It's commonly used in academic scholarship and treats the Bible as any other text. It uses source, form, redaction, tradition, and uh, radical criticism to discover the original meaning in its original historical context and its, and, its, uh, and its literary sense. So, you know, what are we trying to do? We're actually trying to understand what the uh, author uh, was trying to say in the period it was written uh, to the original audience that, that, would, that would be reading it. You know, that's, that's the way we best understand yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a, opposed to the reader response method. And here, the reader or the community perceive, uh, uh, perceives the text as they wish wish it uh, to be perceived. Um, uh, part of that is called the biblical uh, recontextualization or reappropriation. Uh, that is, the text can and should mean whatever a faith community needs it uh, to mean, uh, where authorial intent is not the only one that matters. Um, so as we saw with the quote with, uh, from Josephus, um, 
Josephus, you know, recognized that uh, in those later chapters on the book of Daniel that it was addressing Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, when other when other people were being persecuted, uh, whoever the uh, bad guy was at the time, so to speak, that was their Antiochus. So they're using uh, biblical reappropriation. Okay, that that period had their Antiochus. Now we have our Antiochus, and that could be Rome. That could be you know any uh, you know for uh, for Martin Luther, it was the Pope. Uh, you know, uh, you know, anyone who's kind of like, you know, evil ruler at that age would be their Antiochus. So they're reinterpreting the text to, to fit their period. Um, another method we see uh, used for the Bible is, con is called the concordance method. That's a human hermeneutic, which advocates interpreting scripture in light of modern science. One attempts to read modern science into the text. So example of that, to interpret God stretched out the heavens to be a description of the expanse of uh, space um, uh, postulated by modern cosmology. cosmology. I apologize, my, my, my cell phone's going off. Just for a moment. No worries. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so uh, we see the concordance method used by people like uh, like Hugh Ross, for example, that claims like, oh, you know, you, modern scientific theories are actually, you know, found in the Bible and so forth. But they're really just reading into it. Yeah, and here's another example. Uh, they interpret Romans 8, for example, asserting that the decay of creation is actually described the second second law of thermodynamics, for example. <laughs> um, it, it obscures the text rather than to help clarify the meaning of the text. And we've, we've seen that with uh, like uh, an interpretation of uh, Genesis 1, for example, to try to describe like uh, uh, Genesis 1 describing the Big Bang or, or, or the uh, pattern of evolution, you know, things like that. Try, trying to um, um, coerce uh, sort of modern science into the Bible and find a way to reconcile them such that the Bible is, is always right kind of thing right right so you know they, they kind of view the bible as well it's the inspired word of god so the the human authors of the bible are really just taking dictation that you know that you know perhaps they don't even know what they're writing you know god just says uh isaiah or moses write this down for me and i'll just I'll, you know <laughs> rather than the author actually having an understanding and and you know their own thoughts in, into uh you know what what they're creating um, another method is called the historical grammatical method, and that's and that's similar to the, histor the uh, historical critical method, where uh, it, it's to find the meaning of the passage as the original author would have intended it, and what the original hearers would have uh, would have under understood. So this is a conservative method that opposes higher criticism and liberal allegorical interpretations. Although um, I share uh, the view as author Tom Stark uh, writes um, that they're really not practicing what, uh, what they're preaching. Um, um, he writes that the inheritance utilize the historical grammatical hermeneutic until it reveals a discrepancy between two texts or between one text and a particular fact that will bring uh, ourselves to, uh, to deny at which point we revert to dogmatic interpretation by the virtue of uh, the controlling uh, presupposition that canonical scripture should always be interpreted on the basis of it, uh, that it is infallible and inerrant. The Chicago inerrantists are forced to conclude that it is the interpretation that is wrong and not the text itself. To be an inerrantist, the best interpretation is ultimately not the historical grammatical interpretation, but one that leads, but one that does not threaten the doctrine of inerrancy. So, you know, they claim to use the historical grammatical method to understand, you know, what the original author meant it to, uh, to mean and, uh, you know, to the original audience until there's some issue where they have to start harmonizing it to protect their, uh, you know, their view of, of inerrancy. And, so then the, and then the text, the text is, is sacrosanct. It, it, that's that's what can't be challenged. Everything else, the interpretation, maybe even the underlying science, that 
that's up in the air, but not the, the original text. Right, yeah. So example is, you know, the Bible teaching geocentrism in a flat earth. Well, well, we know we know that's not true. So we got to reinterpret those texts, uh, you know, those those passages that describe a flat earth in geocentrism to mean something else. Because, you know, heaven forbid the you know the Bible can't be wrong. It's you know, we just have to interpret correctly. So so uh what we see in a lot of the writings of the uh, first century BCE and CE is, um, re is uh, readers interpreting the Old Testament and to give it new meaning and to give it an esoteric interpretation. And that's where a new hidden meaning that is intended for or likely to be understood by a specific group of people with specialized knowledge or interests. So again, the Qum Qumran community of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, are among those uh, that practice this. Um, they practice what's called is what they practice was what's called pesher exegesis. That's the, from the Hebrew pesherim, which means interpretation. The scripture has two levels of meaning: the surface uh, for the origin for the ordinary readers with limited knowledge, and the concealed one for specialists with higher knowledge. Mm -hmm. So again. You know, these the specialists had a, their own esoteric interpretation that was obviously revealed uh, to them by by God. Um, also, they practice what's called this topology. That's a method of biblical interpretation whereby an element found in an earlier story is seen to pre uh, prefigure one found in a later story. An example of that is Jonah is the is the prefigure uh, to Christ. We see that in the Gospels where. Where they, uh, Jesus says, uh, you know, you'll see no sign except for the sign of Jonah. So, so Christ is uh, J Jonah is a prefigure to Christ. So, basically, you have New Testament writers looking back in the Old Testament and find and applying that to to Jesus. Um, so again, we we have uh, typological exegesis. That's that's a that's a repetition. Of the pattern of of unbelief and persecution that uh, that the writer of Daniel had applied to the reign of Antiochus for Epiphanes, and then applied it to a later time. That's what I talked about earlier. Uh, the, uh, during um, the the uh, Greek uh, rule, they had their Antiochus, and then later when Rome took over, they had their own Antiochus. So there's there's topology there. Uh, Dr. Dean R. Uh, Ulrich writes, therefore, it may be proposed th uh, that Jesus, Matthew, Mark, and Hy Hypo, boy, I'm, I'm bad at these names, Hippolytus, were not reading uh, Daniel's 77s in a unprecedented way. Rather, they were following the uh, typological example of the Old Testament in early Judaism. So. This is going on quite a bit. So, and we're going to see that with, um, with Daniel 9 in the 70 weeks prophecy. So um, in Daniel 9, Daniel does it himself. Daniel reinterprets uh, Jeremiah, where Jeremiah predicts 70 years of uh, the Babylonian exile. Daniel's going to reinterpret that to 70 weeks of years, which is 490 years. What, so what's a, what's a week have, of, what's a week of years? So uh, uh, a, a week is basically seven years. Um, so oh, you have oh, 70 okay. times seven, 490. So um, I'm going to get into that. that. We're going to be doing a lot, we're gonna be doing a lot of fuzzy math tonight. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's... Yeah. So John J. Collins writes that this is not really uh, derived from the prophecy, but that the prophecy it, uh, is invoked to lend authority uh, to a prediction that is made for other reasons. A, a hermeneutical shift in the, in the history of Jewish exegesis uh, it is the first case where prophetic oracle is explicitly interpreted allegorically or understood to mean something other than it literally says. So, so here we have an example of reinterpreting a older prophet, Jeremiah, into a new meaning uh, that Daniel's going to give it. And then Further commentaries such as Josephus and Christians and the Quran community, they interpret it further. Uh, 
So we're going to be seeing that. So Pesaresk Jesus is found in the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament, like, like, I, like I mentioned. All right, so let's, let's get into the 70 weeks prophecy here. This is a Daniel a, a predicted the death of the Messiah. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to read the relevant uh, um, verses here in Daniel 9. So as we read this, what I want you to do is I want you to put on your gospel colored glasses. <laughs> so what I mean by that uh, is uh, inter interpret it as as a conservative Christian would and and try to see Jesus in these verses, because after all, who is the Messiah? Jesus is the Messiah, right? So if you have an Old Testament book mention the Messiah, well, who must that be? Well, obviously, that must be Jesus. So this text, you know, read it with, with your gospel colored glasses on. So I'm going to start with uh, Daniel 9.2. I'll give us a little background, and then I'll jump right into the four verses, which is the actual prophecy. So in Daniel 9.2, it says, In the first week of his, that's King Darius's reign, who didn't really exist, but we, we talked about that last mm -hmm. time. Um, I, Daniel, perceived in the books uh, the numbers of years, that is, that is uh, to the word of the Lord, to the Jeremiah, must be fulfilled for um, the devastation of Jerusalem, namely, uh, namely se 70 years. So here we have Daniel reading Jeremiah, who uh, reads about uh, the Babylonian exile, which would last for 70 years. So isn't it interesting, too, where we have Daniel, who's supposed to be a contemporary of Jeremiah, actually reading Jeremiah as scripture. That's a that's a clue that this book was written later uh, later because Daniel is actually, you know, going to the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah would have been a contemporary. Uh, so he, uh, he would have he, he would have not he would have either been yeah would have been maybe they would have um, either known each other and or been at least in that general that general time he certainly wasn't considered a prophet then because the prophets had not yet been canonized. Right. Right. You know, his, his, anything he wrote probably been written by his followers, Jeremiah's followers and so forth, and, mm -hmm. and not con not considered scripture until, you know, decades later. Mm -hmm. But you, here we have, you know, the author of Daniel referring to the scripture. So um, what is this word of the Lord? Well, we actually see that in Jeremiah 25, 1 through 13, where it says the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah uh, in the fourth year of Jerokim, the son of Joshua, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, this, the son of Josiah, king of uh, Judah. Uh, this was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The whole land shall uh, become a ruin and a waste, and, and, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So that, that's what Daniel probably read, it is Jeremiah 25 right here and this is where it mentions the 70 years so um in the, in the chapter he laments saying oh you know uh uh the 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 uh the jewish people are still suffering and so forth and they lament you know because uh, of their sinful ways and then uh the uh the angel gabriel comes to him and gives him new insight and what's that insight well that's the 70 weeks prophecy so that's where that's where uh, Gabriel uh, tells him seventy weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring into everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore, understand. From the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in the time uh, until the time of an anointed prince, there shall be seven weeks. And for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with streets and a moat, but in a troubled time. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, in the end um, shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be uh, war. Desolations are decreed. He shall make 
a strong covenant with many uh, for one week. And for half a week, he shall make sacrifice and, and, and offer offering cease. And, uh, and in their place shall be an abomination that desolates until the decree end is poured out until uh, upon the desolator. So a key verse here is verse 26. After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. So an anointed one, you know, what is that? That's the Messiah, right? Well, again, we have our gospel colored classes, glasses on as we read this. Who is the Messiah? Jesus. So, um, you know, some evangelicals and, and, and conservative Christians believe this is an actual prophecy about the the death of Jesus, because it meant, actually mentions, um, you know, the, the, the death of the Messiah. So, so, and there's, so there's, there's, there's a question to, uh, is there not as to what, what that, what cut off actually means, because they don't say he, he dies. So is that when he gets arrested? Is that, um, when he can, you know, no longer speak with his people or is that when he dies? I mean, there's, there's wiggle room in there, right? Oh, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room uh, all through that, all through <laughs> this passage. You know, uh, for example, uh, who is, for example, uh, in verse 25, uh, it says, and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of anointed prince. Who is the anointed prince here? Is that, is that Jesus? Is that, is that uh, some other royal person? Uh, who's the anointed one that gets cut off? You know, anointed one, what's the Messiah? Um, the what? troops of the prince. Who's that? Is that the prince, the anointed prince earlier? Or is that, is that a Jewish prince or, or uh, on the side of God? Or is that a, uh, an evil prince? Well, it says the troops of the prince uh, who is to who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, so that is an evil prince, right? He's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Um, so who is that? You know, well, if you're reading it with gospel colored glasses, right? Well, who destroyed the city? Well, Rome destroyed the city in 70 CE. So that must be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a Roman uh leader probably like titus for example who was the, the i believe the uh, general at the time um uh you know what are these desolations um in verse 27 uh, in verse 27 we read the, the uh, abomination that desolates well that's that's directly mentioned in the gospels um, and generally that refers in the gospels it's interpreted as the destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem but again what did the what did what did the uh, original author intend that uh, to mean well and there, so there was many a, re, there was many rebuilding incidents too right they i mean they gave the the word to rebuild more than once and did they mean the rebuilding of the outer walls did they mean the rebuilding of the temple uh, and this took this took place over a, a, a great deal of time so you you could also shift this around if you wanted if you, if you with your with your uh, uh, glasses, your your biblical gla colored glasses, if you, if you wanted to land on a particular date, you could you you got some more wiggle room there too. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So, so, how do conservative Christians interpret this? Well, and I, I, uh, again, we talk about what is a week. A week is interpreted out weeks of years. So one week would equal 70 years. And, and uh, there's, no, there's no real controversy about that. All scholars interpret it that way. And uh, yeah, I don't think that's very controversial to, to interpret it that way. So, you know, so in verse 25, uh, we read, uh, so uh, you're to know and discern that the issues of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's the starting point until um, Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks so seven weeks so it's, so it's seven times seven that's 49 years and then 62 weeks well th that would be 62 times seven that's 434 years um it will be built again with a plaza and moat uh, but in times of distress so then after the 62 weeks the messiah will be cut off well that would be uh, seven weeks a year plus 62 weeks a year that that doing the math so again that's 
7 times 7 plus 6, 62 plus 7, that's 483 years. So if you wanted to match Jesus, again, we have our gospel colored glasses is on. One way to interpret this is the word to rebuild Jerusalem was decreed by Archaerxes uh, uh, Longimanius, issued on 444 uh, BCE. That's found in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Um, uh, so um, that would be the starting point of the 70 weeks of years. But we, we're going to start at 40, uh, 444 BC. We're going to call that the word. Then we're going to um, we're going to add uh, our 483 prophetic years. I'll get into what a prophetic year is in a little bit. Yeah. And where does that take us to? That takes us right to 32, 33 CE. So, and Jesus is estimated to be to be um, to have been crucified around 30 to 33 CE. So, voila! Here we have a prophecy that talks about the death of Jesus, and it actually calculates it to the exact year in which Jesus was crucified. How about that? Isn't that remarkable? I I, so I, I got to admit I, uh, that is kind of stunning. Quite frankly, that's just like you take you take a look at that, and you're considering how many um, thousands of years between, uh, ostensibly between Daniel and and now, and any future time, that's that's uh, uh, remarkable accuracy. Yeah. So so yeah. So you're you're a think you know you're, you're, you have our gospel colored glasses on. We're a conservative Christian. Here we have Daniel, a sixth century prophet, writing about the death of Jesus uh, in the first century CE and, and prophesies it to the exact year when Jesus is crucified. Isn't, isn't, isn't that incredible? Isn't that a strong piece of evidence of the, of the veracity of, of, of Christianity and, and uh and the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So that's one of the interpretations that, that they give. And that's, that's kind of a popular one. I'm seeing this over and over again. I, I saw a debate, uh, I don't know, within the year. It's hard to keep track of all these debates I've watched. Of uh, Matt Slick was debating scholar fiction. And this is what he presented, scholar fiction. Um, uh, that, you know, that... Uh, you know, look at look at this biblical prophecy. Look how accurate it is. It, it's wonderful. So, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. So, um, so who's the anointed one uh, killed in verse 26? Some conservative Christians believe it is Jesus of Nazareth in the first century CE. Many critical Catholic liberal Christian, and even some conservative scholars believe it, it was the high priest Onias the third killed in 171 BC. And that's a position I hold as well. So I'm, I'm going to explain why that is the case. So who's this anointed high priest, Onias the third? Probably a lot of people don't had never even heard of him. Um, he was the son of Simon, uh, the second high priest during the sec second temple period of Judaism. He's described in scripture as a pious man who opposed the hellization of uh, Judea. He was succeeded by his brother Jason in 175 BCE when Antiochus came into power. Um, Hellization, what does that mean? That means um, uh, uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek culture uh, taking over the land, that they're trying to uh, convert people to you know, Greek culture, to abandon their Jewish culture and religion and adopt uh, you know, the Greek culture and, and, and worldview. Um, second Maccabees three through one praises his piety at, um, as, uh, uh, and his hatred of wickedness. He was removed from his position through political fighting and was succeeded by his brother, Jason and Hellenizer. That's someone who, um, uh, supports and lived by the Greek culture that Alexander the great, you know, brought in, um, he was killed in 171 BCE when he exposed the high priest, uh, Menelius, I'm saying that right, for, uh, for stealing and selling some of the gold vessels of the temple. And then um, in Daniel 8, 10 through 11, um, 
it says casting down uh, some of the hosts and stars, the prince of the host, and in 926, and also in 1122, it shall be broken. You also, the prince of the covenant, are generally referred to the murder of Onias. So, again, uh, more academic, uh, uh, secular scholars, as well as the Catholic Church and other people believe that this, this high priest here, this anointed one, is Onias III. So if you want to do math here, it would be 605 BCE minus 434 takes us right to uh, 171 BC. But um, I don't think the, the math is important here. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think we have to uh, take the, these, these dates that literally. Um, okay. I think it's, um, I think it's more symbolic, but and but it does fit the general period. Um, here's what one scholar uh, offers. Uh, this is in uh, in his writing in the search uh, for the seventy weeks. George Athis Moore uh, of uh, no, I'm sorry. This is uh, oh, unfortunately I don't have the scholar's name. I apologize for that. Uh, anyway, uh, this is from this theological college. This is how he dates it. So he starts at, at 605. He puts this uh, seven weeks within the 62 weeks. And that takes us right to 171, where, where Onias III is killed. So I'm going to go a little bit more into detail about that. Okay, okay so um, how do conservative and evangelical uh uh, the evangelicals uh, interpret this compared to the common critical secular view. Well, when is um, the word to restore Jerusalem? Well, it varies even among critical scholars. It varies. Um, who's the anointed prince of verse 25? Well, to conservatives, it's Jesus. Uh, to um, the critical scholars, um, it was the either Cyrus who freed uh, the Jews, who put an end to the Babylonian exile, or or um, the high priest at the time, which is either Joshua or um, Jero Babel, uh, who, who was the high priest at the time when the Babylonian exile ended. Uh, who was the anointed one uh, to be cut off? Well, conservatives think it's Jesus, where the critical scholars think it's high priest and Isaac the third. Um, the prince that destroys the city, um, uh, the conservatives interpret it as Titus of the Roman Empire or some future Antichrist. Because uh, again, uh, in Daniel 12, the resurrection of the dead didn't happen. So I think, oh, well, eventually Jerusalem will be restored and it's going to happen all over again. Um, uh, you know, which, which is a, a you know, very far off interpretation uh, where critical scholars think it's Antiochus, Epiphanes, um, the, ab the abomination that desolates. What do conservatives think that is? Well, that's the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, mm -hmm. or again, some later event, again, because, again, there wasn't a resurrection of the dead, so it has to be sometime in the later, perhaps. Or critical scholars think, so no, it was, it was during the time of Antiochus. And what, did ha what, ha what happened then? Well, he, he erected a pagan altar of Zeus in the temple itself. That's the abomination that desolates. And the last week of the 70 weeks, well, um, some conservatives think that it's finished with, this, uh, with uh, the stoning of Stephen in Acts uh, 759, or again, some future event um, where critical and secular scholars think, oh, well, it's just, it just failed to materialize within the 490-year uh, period in the second century BC. So that, that, that shows how the conservative view varies from the secular critical view. So, all right, we're, uh, there's just four verses that we're going to uh, dive into. Okay. Um, so we're going to try to uh, uh, dissect it as much as possible. So 70 weeks, that's 490 years, are decreed for your people and, and to your holy city to finish a transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint the most holy place. So again, who's going to put an end to, to, uh, to finish transaction, uh, transgression? Who's going to put an end to sin? 
who's going to atone for iniquity? Who's going to bring everlasting righteousness? Well, for the Christian, who else could that be but, but, but Jesus? Um, you know, and, and again, um, how I interpret it, how critical scholars interpret it, well, um, basically Antiochus is going to come to his end and then the kingdom of God is going to come in and restore the, the, uh, the temple. And that's what happened under the, uh, under the Maccabees uh, for a short time. And then Rome comes along and uh, takes over. So it, it didn't last that long where Daniel prophesies the resurrection, uh, a general resurrection of the dead and, 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 and the kingdom of God coming. And obviously that didn't happen. And that's why some people think, oh, well, it must be some future event. You know, perhaps when Jesus returns. Um, verse 25, the word, uh, know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of an anointed prince, there shall be seven weeks. Uh, that, that would be seven times seven, 49 years. Okay. And for 62 weeks, shall be built again uh, with with streets and and moat but in troubled times so again that's 62 times 7 which would be 434. okay so from the time uh, uh from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild jerusalem until the time of the prince again that's 30 uh, 49 years seven times seven. after 49 years the anointed prince is there's an anointed prince who is that uh, Jerobabel, that is the Davidic prince um, uh, sent by the Persians to govern, uh, to become governor of, of Judah, more li- or more likely Joshua. He was the high, the first high priest after the exile, or King Cyrus. Um, so again, so the word came out in the last few years, and that's that's when Cyrus uh, returned uh, uh, the Jews back to uh, Judah. Um, so again, that, that's, uh, four, 434 years, uh, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. So again, that's the 62, uh, times, uh, seven, or there's, there's a different way to look at it. You could, you could do the 49 plus the 62, right? You can add them together or put the 49 within. The because it depends on which, so, oh, so you, okay. So yeah. you got, so, yeah, okay, so you have uh, two areas of wiggle room that overlap, so you can either add or subtract right. them. Appro- okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so you can have the seventy. We- you can have the seven weeks, and then the sixty-two weeks, or you can have the span of se- of the sixty-two weeks, and the seven weeks is this in there. Yep. Okay. Just just to confuse you further. <laughs> All right. So listen, listen. So, so, I was plenty so, confused so, before this show started, but thanks for you know. Now I'm gonna. Yeah. I'll be lucky if I can yeah. find find my uh, office coming out of here. But all right, yeah, let's. Yeah, okay. So, so verse twenty six. Uh, after the sixty two weeks. Now, after the sixty two weeks, it doesn't say exactly after, right? So, a- any time after the sixty two weeks, the, you have plenty of wiggle room <laughs> there, right? Yeah, that's yeah. And anointed one shall be cut off, and there sh- and shall have nothing, and the troops of the other prince. Who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, its its end shall come with a flood, and uh, to the end there shall be a war. Desolations are decreed. So, how can we interpret that? So, after four hundred thirty four, uh, which is sixty two weeks, or four hundred thirty eight, which is the seven plus sixty two of the 49 years and anointed one shall be killed. So again, so we have two different interpretations here. We could go with the 434 or the 438. So 62 weeks with the seven weeks within it or the seven plus the 62. Okay. The troops of the other prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Right. So what's the, the anointed one? What exactly is that? Well, uh, the Hebrew there is Mashiach, which means anointed or anointed one. It, c- it can be applied to a uh, king or high priest that was anointed with holy oil. Um, it did not have to be Jewish. For example, in Isaiah 45, 1, it declares Cyrus the Great as Messiah. After all, he's the one who freed, uh, put an end to the Babylonian exile 
and, and uh, let the Jews go back to uh, Judah. Um, so uh, there's different interpretations in, in, in the English translations. For example, in the King James Version, it says Messiah be cut off. In the um, New International Ver Version, the anointed one will be put to death. So the anointed one, the Messiah. Well, there's only one Messiah, right? Well, who could that mm. be? Um, the English Standard Version, an anointed one shall be cut off. Uh, the New American Standard uh, Bible, that's probably the most literal English translation there is, uh, uh, besides like uh, Darby's literal interpretation. It says the Messiah or an anointed one. So they're trying to, they're trying to stay true to the, <laughs> to the Hebrew who will be cut off. Um, Young's literal translation, cut off is Messiah. If we can get really literal, uh, the Latin Vulgate, Christ, Christus shall be slain in the Septuagint. That's the um, Greek version of the Old Testament. The anointed one shall be destroyed. Now, a lot of the Christian writers um, of the first century would be reading the Septuagint. They, uh, they'd be reading the Greek. So they'd, they'd be reading the book of Daniel and they'd read the anointed one shall be destroyed. Well, that's going to give them all sorts of ideas, you know, um, and, uh, you know, won't it? Um, so what was this destroy? This was word destroy, you know, Christians and uh, uh, even Jewish commentators of the first century, they pointed it to 70 CE. So they'll argue, well, in a Tychus day, um, it wasn't destroyed. It was just, so it can't be that it has to be in the Roman period in, in 70 CE. Well, the Hebrew root, it, it can mean to destroy, corrupt, to go to ruin, to decay, to be marred, to spoil, to be injured, uh, to, to be ruined, rot, to pervert, deal uh, you know, corruptly, uh, you know, morally, and so forth. So it doesn't have to mean completely destroyed. Um, but many Christian English translations do interpret it as destroy. Um, uh, okay, so... What, what happened in when Antiochus came in? Well, um, as, I, as I described in the last presentation, he came in, he tore down the outer walls. He set, he set, um, he set uh, houses on fire. Uh, he crucified a lot of people. He put an end to um, the offerings. And in fact, he, he, uh, he uh, desolated the altar by sacrificing a pig on it. Um, he uh, he erected a statue of Zeus uh, within the temple. That's the abomination that desolates. So did he did he destroy the city by tearing down the outer walls by desolating the the uh, the, uh, the temple and and the, and the uh, sanctuary and, and and burning houses? I would describe that as destroyed. You know, was it as severe as the seventy e seventy c e destruction? No. But I, I would still say it was, it was certainly significant. Mm, mm. Um, uh, and in verse 27, the abomination that desolates here, the other prince shall make a strong covenant with many for w one week. That's seven years for half of the week. That would be three and a half years. He shall make uh, sacrifice and, and, and offering cease. And in their place shall be an abomination that desolates until the decree end is poured out upon the desolator. So some Christians interpret, interpret he here as Jesus. Um, but again, if we interpret it, we're going to take our gospel color glasses off and we're going to put on our historical glasses. What, what was happening during the Seleucid period where, where critical scholars think this was written? Well, Antiochus comes in. And he, it says, uh, he shall make a strong covenant with, uh, with many. Well, what's going on here? Antiochus forms a covenant with the Hellenizers, such as Jason, who killed Onias. Um, and um, during that time, like they build a gymnasium within, within Jerusalem. So they're, they're, he they're heaven, uh, heavenly, having, having, I'm sorry, heavily uh, Hellenizing uh, the city. So that's this other prince, it's Antiochus. Uh, he puts an end to the sacrifice and offering. Um, in fact, one of the stories, um, I think in Second Maccabees or in Josephus, 
um, he um, uh, he stopped where well, he, he stops uh, circumcision. He makes circumcision um, illegal, and he punished uh, uh, some mothers by actually killing their babies for circumcising them, and makes them actually wear them around their necks as a necklace as punishment. So Antiochus was a, a very cruel, Jesus, uh, and horrible. So that's the sort of persecution that was going on at the time when when the book of Daniel was was written. Um, So, uh, again, so. So to summarize here, I know I covered a lot. So so the angel Gabriel explains that it will take 70 weeks of years for the persecution to end and to anoint the most holy place. So that's 77 times 70 years. That's 490 years. That's verse 24. And then in verse 25, we have f- seven weeks or 49 years. And then in then in verse 26, uh, we have 62 weeks or 434 years. And then in verse 27, we have one week or seven years, which is divided in, into into two half week periods. So that's the breakdown verse by verse of of the of the of the years here, just to try to make it. Uh, Try to you know summarize it and <laughs> try make to, it, yeah, make try it to get the big clear. picture and yeah. yeah. Yeah, and again, it could be interpreted sequentially or overlapping periods. And we talked about you know that the 49 years could be within the 62 years or sequentially where you have 49 plus the 434, which gives us 483. Uh, so there's two different ways to interpret that. So with, right. if, if you have a, if you have a target date in mind ahead of time, it seems like you know between the the, the not knowing which of the, what what constitutes necessarily the destruction of or the order to rebuild or what, what constitutes any of these acts per se, and then you can you can modify the the, the time uh, the time frame. It seems like you can hit a number of dates. Right, and that that's 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 an important point. Um, if you're a scholar. What's the proper way to do scholarship? Are you actually trying to understand what what the author is saying here, or are you coming in with the conclusion that oh, this must be about Jesus, and, I, and we're going to make it fit? You know, what you know, what is the scholarly method? Are we going to reverse engineer Jesus into this and then interpret it that way, or are we going to try to objectively try to understand you know? When was this book written? What what time period is it about? What makes most sense, you know, with that background knowledge, rather than trying to jerry rig our conclusion, you know, into the text, which I think a lot of evangelicals are exactly doing. All right. So, how can we calculate when the when the anointed one dies? Well, you st- where we start from the word uh, uh, from the word went out to restore. And rebuild Jerusalem, so that's plus the 434 uh, years or the 438 that we talked about, either the 62 weeks or the seven plus 62. That's when uh, that would be the year that the anointed one is killed. So uh, from the word, when, uh, from the word, and then you add the 434 or the 430 or the 483, and that gets us to the year. The anointed one is killed. So when is that starting point when the word went out? Well, I I can um, identify six starting points. One is when Cyrus decrees it at around 538, 537 BCE, uh, with Daniel reading um, Jeremiah's prophetic word. So that's one. The second one is the decree of Darius the first. That's um in 520 BCE, and then we have the decree of uh, Artaxerxes. Um, Arte- that's around 458 uh, f- uh, 7 BCE. Uh, I'll, I have the uh, the uh, Old Testament verses here. If you want to look them up yourselves, or this is the popular one that uh, D- D- uh, D- uh, uh, that some evan- evangelicals go with, as well as dispensationalists, they uh, they go with the 444 uh, BCE. That's what I. That's the calculation I did at the beginning. 
you know, to get us right at 33. Um, this on that occasion, Archaerxes granted the Jews specific um, authorization to rebuild Jerusalem's city walls. Um, a fifth one is when it was revealed to Jeremiah. That would be around 587, 6 BCE. And then this is the one that I think makes sense. The, the opening date of Daniel 1.1. That's the third week uh, of uh, Jericoam, which is 605 BCE. So the 62 weeks of, of uh, Daniel are um, probably the period of a general pagan domination over the Holy Land from 605 to 171 BC. The 70 weeks of Jeremiah um, are this, the 670 year period of the Babylonian domain over the Holy Land from 605 to 538 BC. Uh, BC. The 70 weeks or seven years of Daniel are the time that the Babylonians left uh, um, Jerusalem in ruins from 557 uh, to 538 BCE. At that time, Jer uh, Jeremiah received his word of revelation of the 70 years. And that's, again, that's found in uh, Jeremiah 25, 1 through 2. It says the word that came out uh, that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of uh, Jericho, uh, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that uh, this was the first year of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So again, that was 605. Uh, so that's the starting so those are the six starting points that uh, you could pick from. So these are these are those were precise dates, and if you, you a good interpretation, any one of those is a, is a, is a credible interpretation, and and so you you know based on if, you, if again if you're trying to find a specific target date, you can you can say oh well this fits with what we know, which is that Jesus was was the Messiah and and he died and in uh, 33 AD. So given, if you accept that as known, then you can try to quote, deduce what the rest of these are. Is that, is that roughly accurate? Exactly. Okay. So that, that's, those are the starting points. So we're going to pick one of them and then, okay. You add the 434 or 480, 483 years onto that. Uh, but what's a year? Oh dear Lord! <laughs> we have to talk about no, what no, he, no, we no! We're not going to put that year. up for debate now, too, are we? Yeah. <sighs> so we have a solar year, right? Which is three three hundred sixty-five and a quarter days. Of course, you have to, we have to deal with leap years, right? Okay. Or, yep, yep. or it could be a Jewish lunar year, which is three hundred and fifty-four days. So there's four hundred and so there's four hundred and eighty-three lunar years, which equals four hundred and sixty-eight. 0.44 solar years. So, and a lunar year isn't exactly 354 days. It's 29 and 30 days per month corresponding to a 29 and a half day lunar cycle. And it has 354 days per year. Since uh, this is an, uh, since this is an, an, an 11th day too short, uh, the Jews um, add a 13th month to the calendar every few years to keep it in sync with the solar year. Just to like a leap, things like, more. like a leap, and, leap month kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. And they, and they actually Jewish factions argued with each other, whether to use the solar calendar or a lunar calendar. So it depends what Jew Jewish group you talk to as well. Then, um, Matt Slick and dispensationalists and other evangelicals, they use what's called a prophetic year. What's this prophetic year? Well, this is 360 days, which is 12 months of 30 days. And that, that adds in there. So there's 438 prophetic years, which equals 476.38 solar years. This is a common interpretation among dispensationalists and some evangelicals. Where did this come from? Well, this actually was invented in the 19th century uh, by a Christian, in, uh, it's in, it, by a Scotland Yard a detective named Sir Robert Anderson. He came up with this. He uh, took verses out of Revelation and, and Genesis and created this prophetic year. 
Um, <clears throat> again, some interpreters use 430 years uh, being placed within the 70 weeks, within um, the 62 weeks. Lunar prophetic years can be applied to the amount as well. So it takes us to 420 and 427. Again, we're, we're, we're getting into a lot of fuzzy math right here. <laughs> yeah, um, I noticed. Yeah, this assumes that the author uh, had accurate historical information and made no mistakes. Accurate information of the Persian reign was not known to uh, later Jewish writers. There was no ancient record of, of the Medean king named Darius, um, as Daniel mentioned. So, yeah, so, but, you know, our, my, our, in my last presentation I gave like a month ago, we went into details about how uh, all the historical inaccuracies that, Daniel had. So Daniel didn't have accurate information to, to, uh, to begin with. So how can we make these calculations if, if he's, you know, if he's, his, if he's historically accurate to begin with. Also assumes that the author, um, meant that these, uh, that these were to be taken as literal years, you know, should they be taken as literal years? These are kind of rounded years, right? 70, 70 weeks, uh, you know, exactly 490 should it be taking, taken exactly be literal and also uh, with us um, um, modern people trying to interpret this we have to deal with the julian the julian calendar to gregorian calendar conversions uh, which, which was overlooked and confuses the calculations so again you can see this is getting really complicated <laughs> yeah because um yeah because i mean they had the julian calendar back then the gregorian calendar um, wasn't, uh, didn't come about to what, the 18th century, I believe, I forget. So let's talk about this Hebrew calendar. So this lunar solar calendar was derived um, from that of the Asian, from the Assyrian and, and Babylonians. So here's basically the 12 months of the year, uh, the Hebrew names and the length. So you can see each, each month varied from 30, 29 29 30 30 so forth so some years you had 30 uh 353 years some were 354 some were 355 and of course that that threw you off from the solar years so they had to add a, a sometimes they had to add a a 13th month to, to catch up with with the solar calendar um but if you hear an apologist say oh well the Jews followed a lunar calendar and of 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 uh, 360 years uh, uh, days, uh, 360 uh, 360 day year, which is a lunar uh, 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 year. That's inaccurate. That's not correct at all. It's 360 is this prophetic year that Sir Robert mm -hmm. Anderson made up. It is not true at all that uh, a lunar year is 360. It's it's 353 or 354 or 355. And again, every few years I have to add on a 13 month. And so he, um, he, I remember I, I heard it in Matt Slick's debate with Sky of Fiction. He said, oh yeah, uh, a year is 360 days. That's how they did it back then. Uh, you know, if I was debating him, I would have called on, I would have called <laughs> on him big time saying that. Well, and so the the, the, um, right. the he did he did that essentially because he was trying to reconcile these things too, and he sort of he this is how he massaged all the numbers to come up with a a year that that really makes them fit and so sort of doesn't doesn't fit any known model, but but is is it kind of is is the average of a couple of different models yeah. that are massaged. It was was that sort of because he had become a Christian, he ended up. Nobody saw this coming. He just became a Christian apologist. Yeah, there, there's tons of writings uh, and commentaries and, and books and uh, papers written on this 70 weeks prophecy. I, I read a master thesis from a student from Liberty University, which, uh, you, you know, at Liberty University, that's Jerry Falwell's uh, university, oh. which is you know, a very conservative thing. And uh i have his master thesis and he wrote page after page of page of calculations and so forth you know to justify that you know this is about jesus so okay so with all of that which which let's get to the punchline here so we have our starting dates which are six of them we have our years 
And again, we're going by solar years here, because again, we're going by the Gregorian calendar to, to get to 30 to 33 CE. So we have these potential years to work from. What, uh, so we do these combinations. We take these starting points and we add these years to us. Here is, here's what we get. Boom. So those are your possible dates that when Messiah died. Isn't that convenient? Uh, uh, when, when do you want, uh, who's your man? You know, uh, who do you want the Messiah to be? <laughs> we can just, we can just pick, we can pick a date for our Messiah, right? Mm. So there's, there's, I see, I see 32 CE, right? Yep. There's right Jesus, there. right? Well, that's so, not even, that's again, not even, so, so that's just accepting the solar year. That's not even saying that we're going to, we're going to mess with the, with the. Yeah. Well, I, that's, I forget. What, well, I, I did. The, I did in a previous slide. I, I, I did a calculation. You start at four forty four. You do the thirty three hundred sixty prophetic year. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the range of four thirty eight, and that let me see. That is, yeah. So we're gonna go with the prophetic year. That's the three sixty. So we're gonna start with the four forty four. Right. We're gonna go with the prophetic year, which is oh, okay. That's three hundred sixty days. Okay. okay that equals 476 years so it's 444 minus 476 so let's get our calculators here so it's 444 plus 476 solar years oops i'm sorry we have to say minus 444 four, four, because it's 444 BCE, right? Minus, oops, plus 476. That gets us to 32. So there's our answer. Okay. So okay. that's what the dispensationalists and, the, and some conservative, uh, uh, that's some what some conservative Christians go by. They go to 444, they pick a prophetic year, which is the which translates into 476 solar years, and that gets us right to 32. Okay, okay, yeah, so, no, I, mi I, I misunderstood that then. All right, thank you. Yeah, so here's basically the, the these are the, the the two popular ones that Christians go by that want to interpret it as as being Jesus. One is 457 plus 438. That gets us to 26 CE. That's when Pilate began his reign. So the, some go with that, and then others. We'll go with the 444 BC plus the 438, which is 476 solar years, which takes us to 32, 33 CE. So that's what that, that that's that's the math that they play. Okay. So, phew. So you can see, and again, I, I, you know, I, you know, some of the papers I read that justify this are incredible about some of the calculations that they that they've done it. Um, so at that time, how were, how did the host prophecy claims about Jesus formed? Well, they went back in the old Testament and they took a lot of verses out of context of the original meaning and reinterpreted it. So they looked for keywords like son, my son, kingdom, that day, and, and or some verse, uh, reference, uh, referencing the future. And they would create stories about Jesus in a, a esoteric way, for example, in, in um, um, Hosea, Hosea 11, 1, where it says, out of, out of Egypt, I shall call my son. Or um, they read individual lament psalms uh, uh, for a reigning king, like in Psalm 2 or 22. Or um, enthronement or, or birth oracles for former kings and applied it to Jesus, like in Isaiah 9, 6. Or verses where a person is, is persecuted and martyred, like in Isaiah 53. And also, you know, they used the Greek Septuagint. So they would interpret uh, uh, Isaiah 714, where it says a virgin self, self conceive, you know, and, and, and bear a son. So to, to, to finish up, um, our Robert J. Miller writes, to assert that Jesus fulfilled prophecy is, in effect, to profess one's Christian faith. It is not as it might seem at first, to offer evidence for one's faith. 
The claim that Jesus fulfilled a prophecy is therefore not a not uh, not part of a proper argument. It is a profession of faith formatted as if it was if it were an argument. Its function is to reaffirm beliefs that are already in place, and we've seen that. We already believe Jesus is the Messiah, so we're going to interpret uh, Daniel nine to be it. The reasoning must um, must have gone like this: Jesus was the Messiah. The, the, uh, the Messiah was foretold by the prophets. Therefore, Jesus must have fulfilled prophecy. The belief that Jesus fulfilled prophecy had its origin in and grew naturally from the belief that he was the Messiah. That account of the origin of the belief that Jesus uh, was the fulfillment of prophecy coheres perfectly with the finding that um, the claims that Jesus fulfilled prophecy are expressions of faith in Jesus, not rationally persuasive reasons for why one should believe in him. Belief in Jesus came first, and belief that he fulfilled prophecy came after. And because of that first belief, um, uh, and because of that first belief, not the other way around. Um, so again, we start with Jesus Messiah. We're going to read all those, we're going to read all um, with that into the Old Testament. So any Old Testament verses that, um, that, that refer to a king or persecution or a, a son or so forth, or we're going to interpret uh, to Jesus. So that's the end of my presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, that is, um, I, I got to tell you, uh, you know, I, I, in, not a huge math buff, but I actually enjoy this just because it, it's more like a puzzle than that. It's sort of like you got these odd shaped um, blocks that you have to of time that you can fit only into certain places. And then the question is, how many combinations do you have that you can make credible using different? Um, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, puzzle. So what what I want to do here is I'm going to uh, quickly check the live chat and see if anybody's got any questions. Uh, for you. I also think that, um, uh, so I, I don't know, are you, I think you're on our Discord, but I was hoping you might be able to come come by after the show, and if anyone has any questions, uh, they can ask you in the uh, voice chat uh, the lounge in the uh, Discord, and I just realized since this is a, um, uh, somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna get on my case because I, I probably have the, I uh, still have the bad link in this, <laughs> in this, um, description so i will i will uh, modify that and put the correct uh yeah this has got the wrong discord link in the thing so i'll, I'll get that fixed but um yeah i I, th I think um let me end with with this i the i think the clearest way to understand daniel 9 is to understand the period that it was written in and that would be under the seleucid empire under antiochus so if you read it with that in mind uh, the 70 weeks prophecy is going to make a lot of sense. You know, it, you, you see Antiochus Epiphanes in there. He put an end to the, uh, to the sacrifices and authorings in the Jewish temple. Uh, what's, what's the flood? The flood was his army coming into Jerusalem. Um, uh, and you can see uh, chapter 11 clearly describes the events around uh, that period and so forth. So if you, if you understand that you, and you see what's going on, it's clearly talking about Antiochus. So any any view about Roman, the Roman period or, or, or Jesus and so forth um, isn't going to make sense. And, and you can see all the all the uh, gymnastics they have to go through. Well, um, you know, the resurrection of the dead didn't happen and so forth. Or you have to move out that last week to a future period. And again, 70 CE is going to bump you uh, a century ahead of, of, of the events as already described around the Antiochus period. So now you have to fill in the gaps or, or move it out and so forth. It gets very complicated. If you just interpret it as, yes, this is about the Greek period. This is when the, this is when the text was actually written. And, and this is about the events around Antiochus Epiphanes persecuting the Jews. It, it, make, it makes things a lot clearer. And, you know, and who, who was that anointed one cut off? Well, that was the high priest at the time, Oninus III. So, All right. Um, if you read it with that, the text is a lot easier to understand. 
Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, <laughs> we, we all have on occasion tied ourselves up in pretzels to defend something we really wish were true, and we can sort of trick ourselves into thinking that there's a logical explanation, but, you know, you start, and I think it, it does look like uh, that's what's happening, and I think I, I think you made an excellent point about how, as a scholar, you need to you you know come in and try to see what what you're reading and what it says and what it it uh, means in its own context in the context of the time, not uh, to not with an agenda, not with somebody who's so um that makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, yeah. Floyd, thank you very much for uh, that presentation and. Uh, so for everybody who is here, please, if you've, if you've gotten this far, hopefully that means that you uh, like the show, and since the algorithm really does have an impact, it, it now would be a great time to like and subscribe and hit the bell, and that helps us out a lot, and it also makes sure that you can see uh, future shows. So uh, we will be having uh, Dr. Uh, I'm going to call him Dr. Floyd. That way we can I can I can fix that cross that I made. <laughs> We're going to have Dr. Josh on uh, next Thursday, not this Thursday, but next Thursday, uh, to discuss uh, Christian apologetics for the Old Testament. We're also going to have uh, Isandring is uh, going to be on off time on Friday for just a, a, a little. Uh, uh, off time short, and then we're also going to do the after show uh, Friday night. So I hope you will join us. In the meantime, uh, Floyd, thank you very much for coming back and for doing uh, this second part. I, I really appreciate it. I think uh, we had a lot of people here who enjoyed it, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, and I will um, see you all on Friday. Have a good night, all.